I must apologize to Andy. How, how are you fixed for time, Andy? Um, Beverly, this is a terrible thing for me to say, but I have to go at half past because I've got to speak to Public Health England. Okay, that's okay. I will only be, I will be less than five minutes. Okay, fine. So, fine. sorry about that. Um, good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Association of Jamaica Nationals and Birmingham, Birmingham UK and Birmingham and Solihull Mental Health Trust Foundation, it is a great honor to welcome you this evening to this mental health webinar. The theme tonight is access, information, support, and signposting. This is a follow-up to a conference held in 2019, Young Lives Matter, that was also supported by Birmingham City University. Mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel, and act. That means that our mental health influences or we handle stress, relate to others, and make choices. All of us experience varying stresses in our everyday lives. Our ability to cope and handle these stresses provides a glimpse of our mental health. In the past, people had more time on their hands, they worked and studied shorter hours which means that they had plenty of time for recreation, rest, and sleep. Nowadays, we live in a fast-paced world where time has become a valuable resource. People now have to work and stay awake longer to meet deadlines. Students have to stay awake past their bedtimes to study and meet requirements of an ever demanded education system. In combination to a host of other factors has led to an increasing incident in mental health issues, especially at this time of the year, leading to Christmas and New Year, which often lead to suicide. I do have firsthand experience of this as a few years ago, I lost my son at this time of the year due to suicide. Mental health should be treated like a physical illness. Most people who take their own lives really do not want to die. I believe they just want the pain to go away. Please do not suffer in silence. There's help out there. We are pleased to have a team of experts on the program this evening who are uniquely placed to highlight the themes of this webinar and guide you through where and how to access information and support. Evidence is also increasing that the COVID-19 pandemic has affected the mental health of sections of the populations differently, depending on their circumstances. The pandemic seems to have widened mental health inequalities with the groups that had the poorest mental health pre-COVID also having had the largest deterioration in mental health during the lockdown. We are extremely grateful this evening to have Mayor Andy Street, the Mayor of the West Midland Combined Authority to join us this evening to endorse this evening's webinar. I would also like to acknowledge hans New Testament Church of God, Bishop Douglas, and making connection work um, through the page for their support to this webinar. I'd like to thank all the facilitators on the panel for joining us this evening. Thank you all for joining us. I would like now to introduce Mayor on the street. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beverly. I did as quick as, quick as I could. <laughs> you did indeed, as quick as you could. So thank you, Beverly, for bringing us together tonight. I just want to say a few words before I'm going to leave the floor to the experts. But as everybody knows, you can't turn Beverly down when she sends you an invitation. So I had to be here. But also, I was very determined to be here, given the importance of the subject tonight. And as we all know, the subject was important before COVID, but it's been made doubly important by the event of last event. So absolutely right. The webinar is occurring. Enough. As much as we've had a health crisis or a, uh, a physical health crisis over the last uh, nine, ten months, we know that it 
issue uh, shone the light on mental health challenges as well. Absolutely correct the conversation. I also hope that people will say that in our limited way in the combined authority, along with all the statutory agencies, many of whom are on the call tonight, that we've tried to champion this issue in a very practical way. And I want to offer just a little bit of hope. Actually. So I hope people feel that the mental health uh, uh, campaigns over the last few years have really brought much more equality balance between physical and mental health. I'm sure there's a long way still to go, but I genuinely feel that progress in that has been made. And if we've played a small role in that, and I've been able to use this office to champion that, that is a good thing. The combined authorities work, as you all know, comes under the Thrive branding. And just at the beginning of the pandemic, we put all of our resources that we put together in available to everyone at home under the Thrive at Home uh, branding. And I hope that has been helpful to citizens across the West Midlands. I'm also very proud of the work that's been done under the Thrive at Work branding. And we had a little awards event a few uh, weeks ago, and it was just brilliant to see the breadth of organizations that had taken part in that. And the really clear message was there was lots of help to individuals in that program, but there was also lots of improved outcomes for the organizations that were part of that and clearly uh, better mental health for their employees was leading them to perform better as an organization could not have been clearer but perhaps the thing recently that i've been most pleased with and this is the most moment of hope is that one of our programs we called thrive into work this was launched back in the summer of 2018 talking all about the signposting for example and we were looking for organizations uh, to work with us to take individuals who perhaps had had mental health challenges in their previous uh, lives. And we actually uh, have had great success with that. And we announced just last week that that program has actually led to 600 people moving into employment. And actually on the back of the success of that, the government has just awarded us another 1.1 million. Uh, I know that's small by some agency standards for us to continue that program with new groups of people. So there is some genuine good news there. But that's small by the standards of the considerations tonight, I know. But I did want to say a big thank you to everybody who's on the call tonight for their leadership in this agenda. And of course, the ideas that are going to come out tonight that I know are going to be put into practice at a time when we desperately need these ideas. So Beverly, thank you for bringing us together. Rudy Beresford, thank you for chairing us. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not going to hear all the contributions. I was hoping to hear the early ones, uh, but uh, I will no doubt have a report back of just what is said, but all power to you in what you're doing. And of course, and I wish you all a very peaceful, restful and Merry Christmas. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Andy. And I hope you'll be able to join us on the 21st of January. And I'm sure we'll be on time. That, that, so please. As I say, Beverly, I'm not allowed to say no to you. So we'll be there. Yes. <laughs> and Thank have you. a Merry Christmas. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Andy. Um, have we got Bishop Deverton Douglas here from the New Testament Church of God, Hansborough? Yeah. Right on cue. Just arriving, there he is. <laughs> Bishop Deverton, I just called your name. Brilliant time. You just called my name. Brilliant. I'm sorry, I missed, I, missed, I missed my roll call. Sorry about that. No, you're just on time. So I've just introduced okay. you. So you can speak now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, all. I apologize for my tardiness. Uh, a full day just uh, crossed the threshold, so to speak. But I... I want to thank uh, Dr. Beverly Lindsay for uh, inviting to this event and to partner with the other partners uh, to put this uh, well-being and uh, mental health uh, initiative on. Uh, my name is Deverton Douglas. I'm the senior pastor, New Testament Church of God in Lozells, uh, formerly called the George Street Church. Uh, 
the church I pastor, I've been for the past five to six years uh, looking at mental health very seriously. We have had a number of uh, training events and have established uh, a number of uh, mental health champions within our congregation to work within our congregation for our services and also as part of our outreach. Our concern over recent years have been the, the stigma around mental health and how people are perceived, received and treated uh, in our community. And so we have taken steps to try and erode these uh, stigmas. Uh, most recently, we have made a video um, to do just that. And uh, I believe that at the moment also, we are working with a number of other churches to come on board where we can establish what we are calling uh, mental health, what we're calling safe space for people who are suffering mental health. So they would be well received when they attend our congregation. And also that these congregations will have within them uh, champions, people who have been trained and know how to receive uh, these uh, people when they come so that they can feel normal and worship as normal uh, people. So we are looking at uh, community initiatives. Also, we, we, we've uh, teamed up with uh, MIND and a couple of other organizations where we are looking to train uh, people even in the community um, to do outreaches that actually make people with mental health feel more uh, at home in our community. So um, I'll stop there. But I, I, speaking for churches, I would just like to say we are, we are moving in the right direction in creating a comfortable space for people with mental health to also worship among us. Thank you very much for that, Deverton. Just before I pass over to Beresford, um, yes, so my name's Rudy Page, and I've worked in and around the NHS for the last 20 odd years. I've uh, done a lot of work in, in the West Midlands region in, in terms of uh, facilitating leadership workforce development programs with the Royal College of Nursing and another major mental health trust in the region. I won't mes mention their name, but you all know, but they stretch across the black country. And um, also I, I wrote the report, Faith, uh, Battlefield of the Mind, Faith and Spirituality in Mental Health Services which really demonstrated the, the importance of the Pentecostal churches, particularly African Caribbean communities, getting involved in the delivery and support of the mental health uh, services, whether they're within the NHS or with the various voluntary partners. And a key message that um, brings me to be involved with something like this, both personally and professionally, that we know the best outcomes for people are when they're treated with love, compassion, and humanity, which is the integral part of uh, the mental health agenda. So thank you very much for being here. And now I'll pass you over to Beresford, thank you. Thank you very much, Rudy. And also thank you, Dr. Beverly Lindsay. Uh, my name is Beresford Dawkins. I'm the Community Development Manager for Birmingham and Solihull Mental Health Trust. I'm really glad to be here um, and taking part in another first. And uh, again, as Andy Street says, when Beverly calls, um, you have to come running. So I'm really glad to be part of the community and um, central to, to, to this program. Um, I'm really fortunate to work with a lot of partners and most of the partners that will be speaking tonight, I've worked with them in various capacities. And I'm really proud to say that we're developing strong relationships uh, and mental health and challenge mental health stigma, which is still one of the biggest challenges in our community. And we're going to go straight into the presentations. Um, and I'm really pleased to say we have Cruise Bereavement Services with us. We also have PAWS, which is a young people services, and Cultural Connections, Weights, Bethel Health and Wellbeing Network, and, and also Birmingham Healthy Minds. 
and bringing us up at the rear is our chaplaincy service and our spiritual care team. And I think I'm going to go in that order. So that's just to give you a bit of a heads up of what is to come. And as Rudy has said, this is about information, um, access to information and also signposting. When you put COVID, Christmas and the new year together, that sounds like a quite a celebratory time. But for a lot of people, when you put COVID in the mix of Christmas and New Year, we, we can anticipate um, some challenges for some of our most vulnerable people in our communities. And with that being said, um, the services that are, are going to be presenting tonight are there to help. And it's really important that no one um, in our community should be suffering in silence. The services are there, we just need to get the information to them. So that's what this um, session is about tonight. So without further ado, I'm gonna start with Cruz, if I may, um, Andy Page. Um, and I've also got Caroline on the line, who's gonna help us with the screens. So Andy, as the screens come up and as the information comes up, please feel free to, to ask Caroline to move the slides on for you. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, my screen is really flashing. I'm not sure if anyone, everyone else's is. <laughs> like real, it's real kind of flashy on and off. All oh, right, okay. Oh, it's sorry setting down that. now. Not, yeah. not sure. Okay. Can, okay. Yeah. Can I just check with you, Bevis? But uh, you, how long do you want me to talk for? Just a couple of minutes just to go through the services? Were you on mute? You're on mute. I didn't hear what you said there. Sorry. And it's still flashing. I don't know if people can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. We can okay. hear you. A couple of minutes. Really. Yeah, a couple of minutes, please. And at the end of all the presentations, we'll take questions from the general. Right. OK, OK. Uh, yeah, my screen. I can't see a thing here. So I'm going to I'm going to be talking blind, I think. But that's absolutely fine. So hello and welcome. My name is Adam Page. I am what's known as a bereavement specialist. I work for Cruise Bereavement Care and I do what is, whatever is required in that service. But most of the time, I'm either a trainer um, or I am working as a counsellor with very, a variety of uh, clients. And I've got quite a few at the moment. We have certainly had an increase in demand. So uh, just talking about this Christmas period and the services we've got, which would be that, you know, on a daily basis, everybody deals with a certain bucket, a certain amount of emotional distress and things that they have to manage and talk about and get through. And when we're grieving, when we have a bereavement, we actually have to deal with a tsunami uh, of emotions that we need to process. And we often drown and feel overwhelmed with that. And certainly if we're in a position where our mental health feels a little bit fragile or unstable, the ability to, to survive that tsunami and manage it on an ongoing weekly, monthly basis is very difficult. So how our resources sort of link into that over the Christmas period, let me give you some examples. So uh, the key resource we have available is a helpline. And when that tsunami is too much, when we feel that we are overwhelmed with the emotions of grief and we feel very desperate and lonely and isolated, then one of the key things we can do is check in and phone and chat to somebody who's trained in grief and bereavement and understands what you might be going through. We have a local number, which is on this slide here. I won't read them out, but there's one there. We also have a national helpline number as well. And they both, they're both um, manned by people who are trained in bereavement. They're both volunteers. Uh, they, they offer an equal service. Where, it, where it's different is the local helpline. That's the number which, if necessary, can lead into something more permanent for you. Rather than a, rather than a one-off phone call, it can lead into one-to-one -one support ongoing, which currently would be via the telephone. And that's something that you can tap into and, and get a referral with the local phone number there. Uh, the national helpline number is just a one-off support mechanism, but also there's a national website. And I just want to highlight a couple of things on there that, that are there to help you. Uh, there's actually one of those chat bubbles, the kind of thing that comes up when you went to a shopping or a PC World website. And there's a chat bubble that is there where you can chat to trained volunteers. And people sometimes prefer the anonymity of that and the distance and the lack of personal touch. They like the fact that it kind of has that text format. Uh, there is a huge amount of information on our website, booklets, fact sheets, advice, blogs, 
A lot of advice about how to manage Christmas and giving tips there and things and ideas that you can do to help you get through uh, the emotional roller coaster that is the festive season for many of you. If you are trying to, you know, uh, manage through uh, your grief journey, it's a difficult time. And we do have a website dedicated to children and young people, which is there's a link from the national website. But again, for family support, for teenager support, because they don't want to talk to adults. They don't want to talk to anyone else. They want to talk to their peers. And that's the YP website has resources there. So, yeah, check out the website. Use the helpline number. Those are the two main things that I would highlight from our service point of view. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much, Adam. That was very concise. And, and again, the numbers and the details are on the screen there for our general people to, to, uh, to, to catch those numbers. And we'll come back to you at the end. Um, just for any questions. In fact, that was a nice segue into why young people don't want to use your services, mm -hmm. because our next speaker is uh, Khadija um, Satar, who works for PAUSE, and that is indeed a young people service. Um, welcome, Khadija, and thank you for joining us. Thank Over you. to you, Khadija. Thank you, Beresford. Good e evening, everybody. Um, so my name is Khadija Satar, so I work for PAUSE which is delivered by the Children's Society and part of all we think in Birmingham. Could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So um, just a bit about pause. And initially I'll start with our criteria. So if you're under 25 with a GP in Birmingham or a parent or carer or professional accessing support for a young person. So when, when, we, when we talk about pause, what can we help with? We can help with anything relating to emotional wellbeing. And I guess the main thing about pause is that it is a service for young people and it's, it's in their time. So um, we describe ourselves as a place to talk about feelings. So our aim is to boost resilience as well as develop coping skills because sometimes life can throw challenges and curveballs and sometimes it just helps to have someone to talk to. Um, so what we do is that we can, we can recommend some strategies and techniques that aim to make life easier. So for example, if someone's having a panic attack, maybe we can look at that, what's happening for that young person and providing support with that. And then even if there's any issues around sleep or even communication. So often we find that um, we, we don't communicate in the best way. And perhaps it's about looking at how we can communicate in a young person's friendly way. Um, we also give practical suggestions and advice. Um, and also sometimes I think it's just important to have someone to hear, so someone to listen. Um, I know when I was younger, I would have loved something like pause just to come to, like if, you, if there was parents or family or friends that you couldn't talk to, but just have someone there who can support. So what we don't do is we don't diagnose any conditions and we don't make any automatic referrals into other services. We do signpost. So if there are any services that we think we could recommend we, could, we would do so. Next slide, please. So we are young person led. Um, so what does this mean? So this is actually, it's their choice. So often if a parent or carer wanted their child to speak, and if that child wasn't ready, basically we wouldn't force someone to speak. So it's, it's in their time. And it may be the first time they come to us, maybe it might feel overwhelming and and just unfamiliar. And it is about relationship building, looking at how we can build that relationship with that young person, but also when they are ready to talk. Um, so they come back when they want to talk. Um, so it's, we wouldn't book a follow-up session or so forth. They will come back when they're ready. So in terms of registering with us, so if you're under 14, we do need a parent carer to register um, themselves and with the young person. And if you're 14 or over, you can register yourselves. Um, our link is on the Forward Thinking Birmingham website and there's a section for pause and you can find us there or you can register um, over the phone um, which is 0207 841 4470 and this is um, so it's a voice message so someone wouldn't be answering the call but if you leave a voice message and we'll get back to you um, and that's our service so right now we are providing a phone and video service um, just you know, in regards to COVID and so forth. And in the new year, we're hoping to, to look at make, um, adding some appointments as well. So it's all exciting. Thank you. Okay, cool. And this is our flyer, which you may have seen around. Um, 
but it, we can circulate this as well. So thank you. Again, I'm Khadija, and um, that is a very important service. Um, and again, when that's up and running, I'm sure you thought it was a public service normally, um, but yes, when we get back to normality, mm. um, I'm sure we'll, we'll start to see that service used again in the way that we that we're accustomed. So again, staying with young people, and this time young people in services. And again, sometimes young people in Birmingham get a really raw deal, I feel. Um, and again, I've been privileged to work with some really excellent young people, committed young people to, to mental health in particular. And I'm really glad to say that we've got cultural connections with us, um, Nikita Alexander Pilgrim, and also Gabrielle uh, Ayo. Um, thank you for joining us. Over to you, uh, Nikita. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, very Bird. Um, so I'm Nikita, one of the directors of the Culture Connection. I'm Gabriel, um, community engagement specialist and business owner. Okay, so on a professional level, I'm a mental health practitioner. I've been in the field for about 12 years now. And I'm also a PhD researcher in Black Studies. So I specifically look at the relationship between ethnic identity, belonging and mental illness amongst African-Caribbean individuals. Um, so the role that I play is bridging the gap in between my community, fellow African-Caribbean community, and spaces where we're not normally visible or heard. And I take real pride in ensuring that, you know, where we become visible, where our voices are heard, and we have the, the well, encourage people to have the autonomy as well, to take control over their lives, and to kind of um, feel safe with having mental health support that's relatable to them as well. So that's the role that I play. The uh, role that I play is um, I've worked um, with a people ferry in London's crew for over 10 years. Uh, my mum had one in an area called Croydon, which is in uh, Greater London. So the role that I play is we found that when it comes to children, they're very impressionable. Mm -hmm. And what you find is that they need to be able to relate to situations. So when talking to young children, you find that they need to see representation. And also when you're trying to get children out of a certain situation, it's important, I feel, that when you are talking to them, they can understand and feel that you've come from that walk of life. It's not important in all circumstances. But sometimes when you are speaking to them, they need to know and say, okay, this guy or this woman can understand exactly where we're coming from. And the fact that I've um, come from an impoverished background, managed to come out of it, uh, managed to go to university, get a degree. I do make a point that university is not everything, not for everyone, that you don't need to go to. And I always make that a point that I've gone to university. But it's not something that everyone needs to do. And it's very important that we don't always push our kids that route because some of our kids are not very academic. They're very practical. So some may be plumbers. Some may be electricians, some may be carpenters, mechanics. It's very important to understand that not all of our children may go that route. Yeah. So the angle which I tend to come from is the fact that um, I'm a business owner and thankfully pretty successful. So um, I found when I was younger, and my mum used to try and tell me to go to college, go to um, university. My mum went to university, but unfortunately, due to the circumstances surrounding her, she wasn't doing very well at the time. So I used to say to myself, Mom, why should I go to uni when you've gone to uni and it doesn't seem to be working? So the, the great thing that I've got at the moment is that when I, we are speaking to these um, young adults, um, Nikita comes from a mental health perspective and I come from the business side. So I can actually be a representation to show that, you know what, I've gone to uni, I run a successful business, so I can try and lure them away from the route they're going and bring them over to this side. So um, we're going to explain a few of the things that we do yeah. as a cultural connection, which will be on the slide, which will be on the slide. Yeah. So, leading on from what Gabriel said, what we found as well when we did our first ever event, which was the intergenerational event where we brought the community together, gave young people a platform, is that young people felt pressured sometimes to, to by parents to do cert, to go down certain routes, whether it be university, have certain careers, and that can impact on their well-being as well. Um, we also found that young people didn't feel as though there were enough services available to support their complex needs but that were also relatable as well and also that there's a huge breakdown in communication between young people parents and statutory organizations so from the feedback that we had from that event um, we then led on to create culture connection and deliver interventions that are both relatable in their nature 
and that support wellbeing from an early intervention stage as well. And we do that through working on emotional resilience building, um, supporting young people to sustain and develop positive relationships, and also to be aware of them, how their uh, emotions affect how they think and feel and behave. So on the next slide, we're going to go a little bit into what we do and what services are currently available at the moment. So um, we have Youth Decide. And as part of Youth Decide, we have Stage Reality. So that's actually a forum theatre project. Um, so what we do is we use uh, improvisation and role play uh, to explore different situations such as peer pressure, bullying, crime. Um, and most recently, we did one on COVID as well. So young people are actually, what we do is we have our drama specialists enact these situations. Then following on from the first enactment, we then, young people have the opportunity to actually interrupt at any stage that they want to, to change the narrative of what's happened. And that en enables young people to actually be moral agents of their situation and to learn skills in an informal way that they can actually adapt to their everyday life and to be more resilient as well. And in terms of um, their mental well-being, it also gives them coping strategies, but without it being so um, formalized, uh, in that we also have one-to-one -one mentoring as well. And a lot of young people we support, as well as parents as well, um, we find that using the word mental health can scare them a lot. So that's why we still deliver therapeutic interventions, but again, in a way that is relatable. Um, and it's very important that we link in with parents with that as well. So we like to do that. And we get a lot of support from Western yeah. police with that, don't we? Yeah. yeah. So, so we realise as well, in regards to the actual state realities and that we've been choosing that, the mentoring is so crucial and important mm -hmm. um, to the mental well-being of them. And the biggest problem that we found is that um, it's the aftercare mm -hmm. where a lot of organisations fail. Because what it is is that we, we, we lead them up this path. We build them up, build them up, build them up. Then finally, when they really do need us, when they're ready to come out of whatever situation they're in, the funding stops or no one's there to help them. And it's just like when you bought something from a shop. It's great to have the purchase, but now you need something repaired and fixed. It's almost like you can't get hold of them. If you notice that whenever you ring maybe a provider to get something, you can get there straight away. But the moment you're now ringing back and you press option four to now get some help, there's no, it takes forever to get through. And it's not, it's, it's not done by chance. It's actually the system. So we've realized that the mentoring is so crucial in the aftercare. We find a lot of the stuff that we do isn't even funding based. We do it out of uh, the goodness of our heart because we realize that these young boys and young girls just need that extra little bit of help. And that's what we found from doing our form theater project. And then what we also do as well is the empowerment to employment, which is a mixology and wellness um, work training course. So I've got um, a restaurant and cocktail bar. So fortunately um, I'm able to teach how to actually um, make cocktails, to do silver service, waiting, etc. So um, we ran a project. We ran a project last year, um, which was to do with um, eight to twenty-five year olds, which are classified as meets, not in education, employment, or training. So um, we did that with a restaurant in Birmingham and managed to get, I think it was about was it nine or ten yeah. um, young adults on that course into employment. So um, I let Nikita carry on with um, what we yeah. did. Yeah, and as that. part of that, we also do um, one at work training. So in any intervention we do, that's always our priority. So although it's in hospitality and the silver service and bar work, it's also still important that we use our stage realities again and we act out different scenarios that might happen at work, whether it be with your manager, team member or customer, and how you can develop positive coping strategies to handle different situations that will happen. So we're very, very um, you know, focused on ensuring that in any situation our young people are in, they're supported to be able to have that resilience, that bounce back ability, and also, again, working with parents that when we're not there, that, that work can continue. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, our current service offer that we're able to do is then one-to-one -one informal support for parents or carers and also for young people as well. So the referrals can be made on our website, which we put the link there, but cultureconnection.org, you decide. If you go straight to our website, www.thecultureconnection.org, you can just click on services or the youth Brilliant. decide page. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Cultural Connections. Um, thank you, Nikita, and thank you, Gabriel, for a very concise um, presentation there. And again, always encouraged when I see young people doing positive things in Birmingham. Um, so again, we'll come back to you with some questions, um, I'm sure, from, from the panel. Um, our next um, speaker 
is well known to Birmingham, Marcia. She's a CEO of Weights. It's a woman acting in today's society. And uh, really glad to see you here, Marcia, today. And uh, thank you for taking the time. I know you're a very busy woman, but thank you for taking the time to, to present to us today. Um, so straight over to you, Marcia. Thank you so much, um, Beresford, and good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to share what we do at Waits. A lot of people have heard of the, the charity, but have not necessarily know what we're doing. So Waits stands for Women Acting in Today's Society, and I'm the CEO there at Waits. Um, it's a charity supports women going through domestic abuse, and we were established way back in 1993 when I was a little slip of a girl and joined the charity as a volunteer. Um, but since then, we've grown to be a middle-sized charity supporting women right across Birmingham and parts of Sandwell. So that's the corridor around West Bromwich, Smethwick, Oldbury, that side of Sandwell. And what we do is pretty much to help women who are survivors or currently in a domestic abuse situation to deal with their um, emergency needs and then to support them to recycle back into the community. And to do that, we provide a range of services. But before I mention the services, I just to, wanted to quickly um, mention that a lot of our clients who come to us for help and support suffer with some sort or some form of mental ill health. So well, they will have issues around depression, low, low mood, post-traumatic stress disorder, and every single one quite often needs support to access mental health services. And we do that through working with GPs and ensuring that they have mental health um, assessments. So I just wanted to, to, to relay that to, for people who are working in the mental um, health field. So the services that we provide are one-to-one -one support. We have a team of six um, staff who support pe women on their journey. So, and as well as one-to-one -one support, we provide advocacy. So access, supporting women to have representation in, with legal support um, in case conferences, um, if they're going through a court case as to have the advocates, advocate to support them. Um, support women to access legal support, which is quite difficult with um, the lack of legal aid. So we work in partnership with a few solicitors in Birmingham that can give um, advice and support women um, on that journey. We help women to access housing and register with housing providers. And ourselves have four refugees dotted around Birmingham where we provide support to women fleeing domestic abuse in need of a safe and confidential space. Um, these are for women who are not accompanied by children um, because there is, for us, there's not enough um, support in that area for women on their own. Their children might still be with their ex-partners or um, have, um, be involved with um, social services. We um, offer counselling because as long as to support the practical work, we also look at the emotional needs of the client. So with counselling and also therapeutic workshops, we help women with their emotional issues. So we do domestic abuse training so women can recognise the signs and not repeat the cycle. And um, this year in August, we started our new volunteering and influencing project. This is an opportunity for people, individuals who would like to volunteer within weights. And we have roles like befrienders where we're recruiting for befrienders to support women who have been really affected during the COVID around isolation and may be tempted to go back into their situations. Um, and also for don't, um, giving out donations and um, we deliver quite a few food parcels um, during COVID to so support like that. And helping the women to volunteer to build up their employability skills, um, pr 
pre-COVID, what we were aiming to do was to help women to get volunteer experiences so that around their chosen job field. Um, so post-COVID, we're hoping to be able to re-establish that. And we're working with a few other charities to be able to provide accredited training for the women. And the influencing arm is where we're supporting women to have a voice in society. Weights was built on of helping women to develop their own campaigns. And we've been really fortunate to get four years funding to support the women who, are ac who access our service to participate in things like patient forums, um, community-led groups, residence groups, and to act campaign on a wider women's issues as well. So in terms of COVID um, and the Christmas, we are still open during, we are working normal office hours. So outside of bank holidays, we're open nine till five. And at the bottom of the screen there, you can see um, the various ways to access the services, either through email support at weightsaction.org or by telephone. Um, or on our website, um, we do have referral forms there and you can also get lots of tips and advice and support around um, domestic abuse issues as well. Um, yep, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say, um, but thank you very much and I look forward to lots of questions at the end. Brilliant, Martha, thank you so much. And thank you again for your excellent presentation. And I'm, I'm really pleased to say that we've managed to pull back some of the time. And uh, we're just about to go into um, our, our final speakers, which are our chaplain and spiritual care. Um, and it's really important to really understand this particular service because it's scattered all around Birmingham, I'm pleased to say. Um, but again, we need to let our community know about our spiritual care team and also um, the, the, the chaplaincy service that is provided right across Birmingham. So at this time, I'm really pleased to invite um, um, David um, Butterworth, um, who is from the NEC group. Um, have, have I jumped forward there uh, a slide, I think? Probably, yes, I have. Okay, so let me let me go back i'm sorry um let's let's go to bethel and um sorry um bethel health and healing network santos rai is is our next speaker i was a bit too eager to to get our spiritual care team in there um so santos rai is with us and she's going to be our next speaker thank you thank you beresford and um and evening, everybody. Yeah, my name is Santosh Roy. I'm the, the manager of the, the listening service at Bethel Health and Healing Network. And Bethel is a registered charity based in Borsal Heath. We've been registered since about 2006. The service mainly exists to provide health and well-being services to ethnically diverse communities across Birmingham. We particularly try to reach out to individuals who are the most vulnerable, the most needing of support, and sometimes find it the most difficult to access that support. So there are two main services. Now, before I touch upon the, the, the listening service, which is the, the service I'm responsible for, I will mention our doula service. So the doula service is a service that's been running um, pretty much since the organisation was set up and that supports some vulnerable pregnant women. Now, these women could be vulnerable because they've been trafficked. You know, they could have been um, refugees. They're, they could be asylum seekers. They could be women who are, again, ex you know, escaping domestic violence. We match them with a trained volunteer, a doula, and that individual would support them throughout their pregnancy. So that could be attending appointments, it could be providing some basics needs that they might have for their you know, forthcoming child. Often some of these women don't have anything. You know, they don't even have you know, a you know, push chair, all the things that we take for granted you know, when we are planning the birth of our children. So many of these have absolutely nothing. So this service walks with them throughout that journey and beyond the birth of their, their, their child as well. Um, can I have the next screen, uh, next slide please? 
So the, the Rafa listening service, so that service we've been running for about a couple of years now. And it was set up to support people who are suffering low level mental health issues. And so by that, I mean people who are maybe experiencing depression, um, anxiety, and also people who are you know, lonely and isolated and could really benefit from having someone to talk to. Now, GP surgeries, they're full of people who don't necessarily have a, a physical health problem. You know, what they have is just needing someone to talk to. And that often the GP is that person. But GPs don't have the capacity to have, you know, half an hour, an hour long conversations with people. And certainly some of the mainstream services are, you know, overflowing. The waiting lists are, you know, um, as we all know, are increasing. And certainly during the time of COVID, that, that is the case. So we have a, um, a group of trained volunteers. So they've been trained in listen, good listening skills. We train them in safeguarding, confidentiality. We will train them in issues around mental health. So it is a, you know, a, um, individuals who, who know what they are talking about. And that individual also um, are trained in confidence because that's so important when people are talking about their mental health issues. So individuals can have access up to 12 sessions with their, with their, with their particular listener. They can access the service by telephone or by video conferencing. Um, some do it by Zoom, some have done it through Skype, WhatsApp. And referrals can then be made by, um, so online, you can also call us um, using the telephone numbers which are on the screen. Now, in terms of Christmas, the services are running as usual, um, apart from the, the bank holidays. If you, you know, if you make a referral online or to telephone, somebody will be there to take that call. And the, the way the service works though, is when a referral is made, we will carry out an initial assessment just to understand a little bit more about the needs of that individual. You know, they may have some cult cultural needs, may have language needs. Yeah, our listeners, we've got about 30 at the moment, are from all sorts of cultural backgrounds. You know, some of them are Bengali, we've got Urdu speakers, Mirpuri, Punjabi, Somali, and Eastern European. So we do try to cater for as wide a possible um, group of people um, that are representative of Birmingham. So yeah, um, that's us um, at the Rafa Listening Service and um, and please do get in touch um, if this is a service that could be of benefit to you. Fantastic, if thank you. Sorry, Santosh, you were gonna say something? No, no, that's fine, thank you, Beresford. Okay, thank you, Santosh, that was excellent. And again, I'm sure you would agree that the, the speakers have been a wide ranging, very diverse, uh, multidisciplinary services that has been provided right across the city. Um, and now, at the appropriate time, um, I want to bring in our spiritual care team um, um, and uh, NEC group, Dr. David Butterworth or Reverend David Butterworth. Um, and um, if you yeah, thank you, Caroline. And David, thank you for joining us. And really, just wanted you to tell people about your fantastic service and also about the spiritual aspects of who we are as individuals. Thank you. You're on mute, Dave. David, if you could take yourself off mute, my friend. I thought you'd control of all of that. Uh, forgive no, no, me, no. everybody. Uh, it's good to be with you this evening, and it was excellent last night as well. And um, more of these evenings and day sessions need to be made available and more regularly um, on wider media um, platforms. I'm the lead chaplain for the National Exhibition Centre and the ICC and the U and the Utilita Arena in the city centre. And um, we have a team of chaplains in the business. Uh, many of them are voluntary chaplains. Some of them are ordained. Uh, some of them are lay people. It's lovely to hear uh, the story from uh, Santosh and other people about listening. Um, and I wonder, uh, perhaps an outcome of all of this might be that there might be more regular interconnectedness in the wider West Midlands of where we are and who we are. And um, I'm a great admirer of Beres Beresford's work and Carol Wilson's work. And um, 
the more we can actually do together, the, the better it's going to be. Uh, but in a nutshell, at the NEC, it's a really outstanding um, place of employment and recruitment. And it has a wealth of pastoral care. It's a business that really, really does care about its people. It just doesn't say it. It, uh, it does it in practice. Um, so I, I've got an office at the NEC and at the ICC and um, involved in a lot of different areas of the business. Um, I was really pleased to hear about uh, our young people's focus earlier. And one of the things that we've done at the arenas in the last couple of years is actually uh, with the help of our well-being team from the NEC and uh, the support business partners like OCS and CBRE, um, we've actually gone to some of the massive con con concerts at the uh, arenas um, wearing our mental health um, green ribbons so people know who we are and we've been there to greet the mums and the dads and the children coming through uh, the last one we did of a significant size before covid was when uh, ariana grande came to birmingham and um, people might think well you know what's a chaplain going to be doing at a concert like that well firstly it's enjoyable and then secondly the rainbow of young adults coming through the doors and that they they see that they're in a safe space and um, Last night we talked about places and spaces and people like us, ambassadors for well-being, need to be perhaps a little bit more confident and uh, overt in who we are and where we are and not step away but step further closer to um, the people that need help. Um, I would say uh, quite confidently, um, please, if you are in Los Elves and you're developing um, well-being ambassadors inside your church or wherever that might be in a Gurdwara or a mosque, um, also encourage your people and um, congregational families or humanist families, pagan families, to recognise that there are people like chaplains and listening services inside the businesses, perhaps, that they're working at. Um, and if there isn't, uh, ask them to encourage and challenge their well-being services and well-being managers to say, well, let's look at chaplaincy and see um, how we can get some of the, the gifts and the graces that uh, Santosh talked about earlier inside the business on a more regular basis so that <coughs> at lunch times and other times people can actually come and have a proper conversation. <coughs> Excuse me, I talked last night very, very briefly that at the ICC, the International Conference Centre, next door to the Rep and Symphony Hall. Um, we developed with the, with the well-being ambassadors of the business a, a Zen room so that people that were having a wobble or feeling as though I can't cope, uh, and you know how um, you need to keep yourself together at your desk. Well, not everybody can do that. So the Zen room was provided a year or so ago where it has soft lighting, comfortable chairs and signposts to all the different organisations that might be able to help. Um, if we want the, the well-beingness of uh, our city and the West Midlands and our businesses and our universities to be better, we're just the people that need to be able to speak about it more and not be shy about speaking, but step forward. And Carol Wilson, who I'll pass to um, with Beresford later, she coined a phrase last on last night's session, do not be afraid to say, I need help and if I can help anybody on this uh, session this evening to make contacts with uh, different faith groups different business organizations where there is chaplaincy um, or there is not yet chaplaincy uh, but we know we might be able to uh, step forward in that give me a call and I'll be happy to uh, liaise with you thank you Beresford thank you for so much brilliant thank you very much David and uh, our partner in crime Carol Wilson is is, is <laughs> next up and uh, again, Carol is our lead spiritual care, lead for Birmingham and Solihull Mental Health Trust, of which I've known and worked with for a long time. And um, really, Carol, the last word is gonna be left with you in terms of presentations. Um, so um, over to you, Carol. Goodness me, Beresford, I don't often get the last word. <laughs> <laughs> Method to my madness, Carol. <laughs> oh, nice. Um, it, it's a pleasure to be here this evening, folks, and thank you for your commitment. Um, I'm delighted to be speaking alongside uh, some colleagues who I know well and others who are new. Uh, mental health is just so critical, isn't it? Yes. We all, we all have mental health. 
we all have mental health. Some of us in the same way we all have physical health. Some of us will be experiencing good mental health. Others will be sadly experiencing very poor mental health. And most of us will be jogging along somewhere in the middle. Um, you may just care to cast your mind back over the last working day and think about how your mental health has fluctuated across the day and the things that help you to maintain your mental well-being. When we talk about mental health care services, and I, I am the head of spiritual care for the mental health care service, um, Birmingham and Solihull Hall here in Birmingham and Solihull. Hall, when we, when we talk about those level of services, it, it's often for people who really are, have become quite unwell. Um, and part of our mission is to say to people, and this is going to sound very odd, but um, uh, we want to be out of a job. We don't want people to get to the point where they need um, the kind of support that our secondary care services need to offer them. We will always be needed for a small number of people, um, that's fair to say. But an awful lot of people, if they get the right help at the right time, can actually uh, recover and move on. Uh, you might be surprised to know that 95% of people who receive a diagnosis of a mental health condition go on to live what they describe as a, a full and meaningful life. It is not uh, a life sentence that so many people believe it to be. And I'm really, I'm really proud to hear of so many people who are working to really tackle that uh, stigma that is around about um, mental health care. You might be surprised to know that even a spiritual care service exists in mental health care. You might be even more surprised to know that the service that I and my team provide is representative of the demographics of the area we serve. So 50% of those hours are, are Christian, 25% uh, are non-religious uh, spiritual care, 20% uh, are Islamic, um, and the remains is, it, it are mopped up in, in, in smaller, smaller numbers. One or two names just in the context of, um, as uh, Dr. Beverly Lindsay uh, referred to in terms of the, the context of uh, communities who ha have been disproportionately impacted. Uh, names that you might well know if you're from that uh, particular, those particular communities, Bishop Delroy Mason, Bishop Mike Royal, are both members of my team. And they both work uh, incredibly hard uh, promoting the uh, importance of taking into consideration people's faith and beliefs when we talk about care. I was very um, humbled, I think is the right word, um, uh, and commend uh, Dr. Beverly Lindsay to in her sharing of her personal loss to suicide. We don't talk about it. We just don't talk about it. And yet we've all been impacted. We all know somebody who has died by suicide. And she's so right that for the vast majority of people, it's not a case that they no longer wish to be alive. They just want the pain to end, as she so cleverly put it. Long before we get to that point, there's so much we can do. There's so much we can do. And I just want to encourage you that faith and belief is very much part of the holistic care that we at BSMHFT offer our uh, patients, our carers, our service users and our staff for that matter, particularly in this season, um, which uh, as we all know, has been a real challenge. Help is available. The hardest thing in the world, the bravest thing in the world is to say, I need help. And it's there. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Here's the number. It's been in the chat as well. 0121 262 3555. If, 
one thing can change as part of these conversations, please let it be that we can talk about it, we can spread the word in our communities. You can get help, you will get help. I know we're not perfect. I have a second job, kind of. I'm the head of customer relations, which is our, our pals and complaint services. I of all people know we do not always get it right. However, don't ask for help. Going to be tricky if things have got to the point where we really do need help. Please encourage people to speak out. I just want to absolutely reinforce everything that my other colleagues have said this evening. They're wonderful services. Um, I, I'm delighted to know that there is so much uh, available, but please let's just keep having that conversation. Let's get the message out there, ask for help. You might be surprised to discover that actually, yes, your faith and belief will be taken into consideration. Whereas for thank you for the opportunity, um, it's the second time in two days that you and I have been, <laughs> and, and David for that matter, um, <laughs> have been um, uh, have been on, on online with folks but uh, you know for me that's that's just uh, a privilege to be able to get that message out to people Beresford fantastic thank you very much Carol um, and again thank you very much for those very poignant words um, and again you know these spaces we want to suffer in silence and as Carol has pointed out, the, that number, 0121 365 is a number that you can call at any time of the day um, and get help. Please do not suffer in silence. Um, we, we're about to go into questions and answers, and, and please make use of the chat. Um, we're, we're not promising to get through to everyone that has a question, but if you have a question, put it in the chat myself and Rudy um, will try and facilitate the process. Um, and again, if you take a look in the chat, um, um, you can see those numbers that have been given out by our colleagues right across um, all our panel members. And again, I want to take this time to thank all the panel members for taking the time today and absolutely sharing some really good information um, on, on this first ever chat in this way. So thank you. Um, Rudy, I'm going to invite you back in. Um, as we kind of co-facilitate the questions together. Um, and um, over to you, Rudy. Right, okay. Um, I, I have a question actually for all of the providers as I was listening before we go into our general uh, Q&A was that, um, is there much referral between services? Because obviously there's a lot of specialists in terms of specialisms, I should say, in terms of delivery. And I just wondered, Beresford, you may be able to answer the question. Yeah. Um, if, if, if a member of the public does access one service and it might not be quite the fit that they wish, whether there's a referral system. Yeah, sure. Um, you're talking about a person-centered type of approach there, aren't you? I guess. Yeah, yeah, that, that collaboration, because, you know, generally, because we, we're, we're talking about access and normally the public, they're not concerned who the individual provider is, but they can access the service they need. And it might be, you know, whatever number or, or website that they come across, especially um, it, across the West Midlands. So I just wondered whether there was kind of any referral going across the sector. Right, somebody's got their hand up there. Is that Santa? Yeah. yeah. Yes, please. We cross refer all the time. So one of the reasons we do an initial assessment is to understand what the needs of that individual is. I mean, we do get a referral form from all of the referral agencies. So some information is there, but yeah. sometimes it's not the detail that we need. So we do speak to the individuals, understand if our service is the service that they were um, hoping to access. And, um, and if it isn't, we do then cross refer, you know, we do re re cross refer to, you know, domestic violence agencies, to other mental health services. 
And if we can't help, we then refer them back to their own referrer and we speak to them um, before we refer them to the referrer and say, look, we don't think that we are the right agency for them. However, we, we, we do make suggestions whether we think that could support them. So absolutely, we, we hate passing people pillar to post. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we've all experienced that, haven't we? We've been on a telephone call and, you know, we think actually we can't help but phone up another number, you go there and you can't, you know, no one's there either. So we do try to be as, you know, proactive in that referral process, you know, to phone on ahead and not just simply pass in a number and expect them to, to go to the next agency. That, that's excellent because as we know, whereas for the public, it's about information, advice and guidance. That's, that's what they... Absolutely, and I think Marcia's got a hand up, and I think Khadija oh, yeah. and probably Adam could say And Joe, yeah. Joe Green. Did Marcia, you... go ahead. Yes, um, yes, to agree with Santosh, um, the, the assessments that are taking place helps to understand what the needs are. Um, what we do at Waits in, in terms of, as well as looking at the needs, is we look at the organisations that are needed to provide the specialism within the case. So then we end up coordinating the services. Quite often when people are in difficulty or live complex lives, it's difficult for them to navigate the various um, partners and places where they need support. So we act as that um, country and also if the relationship breaks down within the service as well, we can sometimes help mediate. It could be that the client doesn't quite understand what social services mean, so they need somebody to interpret that message for them. So yes, so we work with Santosh and quite a few other partners that I see on here tonight. Yeah, brilliant. Joe, I think you, you had a question. Joe Green? And also Dean after after Dean. Thank you very much. I was actually reaching across my screen, but I was thinking I did want to ask a question, so I'll ask it anyway. I got forced to ask it. Um, right, so my question, I'm not sure how it'll be answered because actually um, it does actually, um, it's irrelevant to across the many people that have spoken. Um, and I just wanted to ask the question really around um, like disability, special educational needs, autism in particular, whether across some of the, um, these organisations that people do have training within um, to take people um, as well from, from with special educational needs, learning difficulties or autism. So yeah. I don't know who wants to take that question. Thank you. Good question. Deetia and then uh, Santos. Santos has got a hand up as well. Yeah. I think Deidre? for that. Yep, cool. Thanks for that, Joe. Um, I think for us, we've had some, so we're no means specialists in autism, but we have had some training. And I think even now, because due to COVID, we're providing the phone line service and we're looking at how, what we've noticed is that it's not very, um, like for young people who have special educational needs, it's not very friendly for them. So what we're doing is we're looking at video calls for them. And even in the new year, looking at how we can, maybe incorporate a face-to-face, -face. so booking an appointment in a, in a COVID-friendly way. But I think that is a gap um, that is not being met within this online services, but how we are supporting as well is the parents and carers of, of these young people as well. So providing them with the support. And again, just to the signpost question earlier, um, but by all means, like we, we are not like, um, when, we've got our trade basically and other people have got their trade but it's about looking at how you can best support that young person and their family and then signpost accordingly so we wouldn't refer but we would suggest that like this cruise for example we have signposted there papyrus and um, even weights of um, yourselves as well so there's just various organizations that we can signpost to but it's about that young person or parent or carer having that autonomy and that confidence to make that referral themselves yeah actually just to clarify the point thanks for that Khadija because when I said referral I did mean signposting really that's what I really really meant particularly now with the huge change that's going on community partners are, are, are really going to be integral now with change with the CCGs part of the ICS and all that kind of thing so at this point of access for the public on mental health is going to be really even more important than it is now so that level of collaboration at that, this level is going to be so important. Yeah. Santosh uh, and then David. 
Thanks for sharing your hand up. And then David, one second. Yeah. You had Dean up. You had Santosh. Uh, of course, I'm Dean. Sorry. Yeah, so just picking up the, the question about autism. So, yeah, we're exploring a collaboration with Resources for Autism. And so that's a charity that works with all ages. And um, we've had some tentative inquiries, but we felt that before we take on those individuals, we do need to understand autism a lot better. I would not want to, lose, you know, let them lose, you know, with our volunteers, with that that knowledge and that experience. So we're looking to source some training um, going into the new year that's already planned. And we'll train a number of our volunteers so they'll become specialists within our team. Now, the reason we've, um, that charity, and we've, we've sort of discussed the, the, the issue is that they can't cope with the, the amount of referrals that they are getting, you know, um, partly due to COVID, but just generally as well. And so they are looking for agencies that they can refer to. And, um, and so, yeah, we do feel that is gonna be an area that we certainly wanna develop in the, in the next 12 months. Beresford, um, Carol Wilson's put in the chat room, we've just commissioned training from Autism West Midlands. Brilliant, fantastic. Yeah, so that training is going to be made available to a um, hundred of our, um, nursing and allied health professional, um, including uh, spiritual care chaplaincy uh, staff, um, which is in, in for, from two aspects. One is about um, uh, understanding what we mean by autism and the impact that autism can have and how people can present. Um, because we, we know, particularly interestingly in women, that it's very underdiagnosed. Um, and, um, and secondly, um, some just really basic skills based stuff about um, helpful ways to, to work alongside people who um, are, 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 have been identified as, as, as being on that spectrum. Yeah. So that was a good question, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Dean, sorry, we've kept you waiting, Dean. Um, down there in the north coast in the Caribbean. I'm not happy yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah, um, I want to thank you for having me, Rudy, you know, especially. And um, all night last last night, I've been trying to work on my British accent, and I'm like, I was almost this close of getting it. But I want to thank you guys for having me. Um, actually, I'm in Connecticut. You know, I've served as a Scout Ambassador for over 30 years. I've represented Jamaica at its highest level. I trained some of the top Scouts in both in the US and um, in Jamaica. But I'm presently working with a community that is very strong, you know, I would say right off the negativeness, but it is one of the most beautiful places in Jamaica, which is in, in Hermitage in the Kingston Seven era. And um, we have divided the community in different segments, and I think mental health is, is a part of one of the topics that I would like to, to focus on. I myself have been hospitalized for over a year. You know, I, you know, I just as I have I had completed my my, my 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 bachelor degree, I was in a nurse's home for I mean, one year, two months, my father died while I was in a nurse's home. I went through a divorce. I I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And when I hear the speaker said she lost her son, it 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 is so touching when you as a leader doing so much. As I said, I've been giving service at all level in the community in Jamaica. And when things happen to you and you don't want to talk about it. The greatest healing is to tell somebody what is what you're going through. And this is when I before I leave the nurses home, they said my therapy is to do what I like. I came out of the nurses home, I couldn't walk, I'm I'm in a wheelchair, and I get back in the scout and I meet Rudy, I rap with you people, and I feel like I have so much but this is what I like. And I tell my story and I, I would continue. The more I tell my story, the more, especially black men, you, know, you talk about prostate, go check yourself. They don't want to accept 
that they have a problem. And the more you tell your story, it's the more the ego becomes ill. And you, when you tell your story and somebody else get ill from your story, it makes you feel better. And I just want to tell you how glad I am to be on your program. And I, wherever I can tell my story, to encourage other, especially black men, you know, to, to empower each other, you know, keeping it is a is like it it will explode in your body and it becomes more dangerous when you keep certain things. And the healing is to tell your story. And uh, all these agents, I'm gonna need you because we're gonna be create. We're gonna be having seminar in my community that all of you is so valid to be here, and I'm so excited. I, you know, almost get up and jump and kick and, you know, so it's a pleasure to be here. The, a... the, I will make sure they get your contact. <laughs> Don't worry. Carol, Carol, I think we've just been invited to Jamaica, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, as soon as you say that, Dean, you're in trouble, I tell you. <laughs> Is there more than one Carol on the call? Because I don't want to get... Oh, no, I'm referring to you, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. I've never been to I've never been to the Caribbean. <laughs> so, just I I us, you see. And, and tells me often that it is 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 uh, it is it is heaven on earth. Brilliant, David. No, I'll take I'll, I'll take yes, Carol please. Wilson and also Caroline Mitchell, of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I just wanted. Means... To, sorry, I I've just wanted it. to uh, perhaps offer a challenge to everybody this evening. And um, if there's one thing we could do, what would that one thing be? There's probably 50 people on this webinar and uh, we're all influencers. We're all ambassadors um, in one way, shape or another. And I, I just wonder if just, you know, if we made connections with uh, one person or two people tonight and made a follow up one-to-one -to, -one to say, how can we go like this? in 2021. Um, it was only by going like this for a little while that Beresford and I got in contact with each other and, uh, um, you know, Khadija uh, became a friend last night in the in the webinar and, uh, and I've loved a lot of things that people have said, but often we walk in funny pathways, don't we, that we walk in parallel rather than walking hand in hand. And, yes. um, you know, I've been to Jamaica years ago and loved it and uh, people in Jamaica changed my life. and. Um, if I can do anything for uh, black people in Birmingham, please let me know because I'd really want to do that. And um, you know, with um, Beverly uh, being with us this evening, it, it's fantastic. And uh, she's a, a primary ambassador, if I might say so, Beverly. I saw you at the uh, Open Iftar last year at the University of Birmingham, where there were 600 uh, Muslim men and women gathering. And those platforms are big spaces and we're given that privilege to speak from here and our hearts here about caring for people. And that's why I would never shut up really talking about the excellent stuff the NEC does, because um, it's a primary employer um, in the West Midlands and it's got pastoral stuff running through its veins because people matter. So I'm gonna put one or two contacts on Twitter later. And I've been searching for your Twitter messages whilst we've been looking and um, I'll knock on your door if you don't knock on my door. Um, yeah. uh, so it's a wonderful evening, Beresford. You should be proud of this inaugural evening. So Beres, I think I saw Lakva, Lakva had a hand up. Okay. Oh no, now now I'm in trouble, everyone. The boss is in the building. <laughs> that's why I'm in serious trouble now. That's, that's why I mentioned it. Oh, thanks Good very evening. much. Good evening, everybody. What a fantastic session. It's been marvellous to hear from everybody. Um, I am a colleague of Beresford's, we work in the same team. Um, and what I wanted to say was that really we shouldn't underestimate our collective power sure. as members of the community, as people with lived experience, as people who are leading the working communities support individuals. It's not all about the NHS and local authority. We need to understand our collective power. And I think there are real opportunities now, 
So the STP, Sustainable Transformation Partnership, which probably means nothing <laughs> to some people, but basically it's a collective of all the um, major organisations across the city. That's the NHS, the local authority, public health, social care. Um, and, and they're really focused on the agenda around tackling health inequalities. And I think we need to step up to that challenge because we cannot allow decisions about our communities to be made by people who do not live in our communities and do not live and breathe the issues that our communities experience. So I've been part of a group um, in the STP that have been looking at tackling health inequalities. And one of the things that I've been advocating is that it has to be a co-production. Mm -hmm. It absolutely has to be a, a co-production program with our local communities. So I think this is the time to up the activism, to demand an equal share of power in making the decisions that are ultimately going to impact on our communities. So it's fabulous that we're having these conversations um, and I would like to share with you some opportunities over the next few months to really get round the table as equal partners and demand um, the right to actually speak as equal partners around the sort of issues that should be prioritised and the, short, uh, the sort of strategies that really need to be implemented. So I think we've got a great opportunity at the moment for the people on this call and beyond. Um, it's, it's fantastic to raise awareness amongst communities and to you know, help people understand their rights and what's available. But it's also perhaps what we've learned from 2020, an absolute op opportunity to up the activism and really demand what our communities absolutely need and should expect um, from uh, decision makers. So all I'm saying is let's galvanize all this enthusiasm and commitment um, from everybody on the call and beyond uh, and really speak with one collective voice from communities and the third sector, community organisations and be on an equal footing um, with organisations that actually ultimately have the decision making power not only over funding but also policy decisions. So that's what I wanted to a great thought. And Thanks, Latvia. Yeah, seriously needed. Um, I, I wanted to come back to Beverly <laughs> right at the top, you know, very, you know, candidly shared her experience. And I think there's a link between crews and, and cultural connections and also pause. Um, over the years, I just think there needs to be some collaborative effort in terms of the communication channels around you know, the issue that is suicide. Um, and I just wondered if Adam, if you had any views on, on how we should be working closely with young people in, as well, um, and, and, and parents and carers in particular, you know, where, where they're suddenly hit with all of a sudden, you know, this, this situation happens and they're just left. For some people, they're just left for moments and years um, without the support. I just wondered if you could just help us through how we, we create a support, a better supportive or improved network on this. I think what, what, what I notice and, and working, we have a um, lady called Lisa Ray Doctor is our children and young person worker. So I kind of sit opposite her in the opposite in the office as it were and get a lot of input with her and do training with her and I think what we get what we notice the most is one of the big obstacles is this kind of knee-jerk reaction that bereavement is causing everything um, rather than seeing it as just one of the many factors that shape that young person's experience and maybe what has 
you know, derailed them a bit or affected their mental health in a big way. And we, we, we often find that um, the younger the person is, they're often fine when they've had a bereavement. And actually the biggest influence, the biggest detrimental influence is the parent who is struggling with the grief and bereavement. And it's, it's their lack of mental health and self-care that is then impacting on what otherwise would be a natural, healthy grief journey for the child to go through at a, an early age. So, so we really do foster the idea that A, bereavement isn't the be all and end all of everything to do with their mental health. It isn't the complete 100% reason why that child or young person is struggling. We really advocate talking to the parents, the caregivers, the teachers, and training them and educating them and making sure that they have an understanding of what children and young people need. And if it was one thing, if it was one tip, if it was one area, it's allowing kids just to say how they feel and just let it all out and just go, Bleh, I just feel sad, I feel upset, I feel, you know, estranged, whatever it is, just, just let, encourage them to get it all out. How that then works with other organisations, a lot of people here have, have, have clearly implied that that's a message or a service that they offer, that listening service. Um, and it's about having that emotional listening service. And I think we, many of us, we overlap in, in that very simple profound tool don't we we all overlap in that simple profound tool of just being there and letting them feel and express and, and, and get out whatever's going on for them but we recognize it isn't always bereavement that would be my one key message is sometimes they get pigeonholed as a as a bereaved young person and that's that's the cause of all their problems and often it's far more complicated um, just wondered if Khadija or, or, or Nikita you wanted to say anything about that yeah just following up um, Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Adam. Just following off from Adam, and we find that as well for parents or carers, it doesn't always have to be in a formal situation getting your child to express their feelings. Sometimes it can just be on a drive home, walking, eating your dinner. Don't make it so intense because that will put less pressure on your child to open up as well. Um, and it's just different techniques that you can do, such as just I don't know, just doing it informally, mm. really, isn't it? Um, not saying, oh, okay, so how are you feeling today or what happened with this? Try to use creative ways to get your child to open up. But as when they do, don't shut them down either. And and don't, even if you don't agree with what they're saying, don't don't make them feel bad for expressing that because then they'll just close back up again and you probably won't get anything out of it. Brilliant. Deja? Yeah, just on the back of um, what was said, I think what we spoke about yesterday on the radio about just acknowledging that feeling. So if a child is feeling sad or unhappy or um, j just any emotion, but not to take it away from them, just let them own that feeling and just know that sometimes we are going to have feelings that are uncomfortable. And I guess like we, we can look at duality in things. So actually if I'm always happy, would I, uh, sorry, if I'm always sad, would I always appreciate happiness? and just vice versa. So actually, if I didn't know what to compare it with, and I just think sometimes we're just so quick to quickly put a plaster on it, but sometimes it that's not the right thing to do. It's just about being present and being supportive and just acknowledging that, that the pain is real sometimes and it's part of life's process. And there will be a rainbow at the end, there will be ease, but it's just going through, the, through that time. So I think that's really important. Thank you so much, everyone. And um, really, I think we're coming towards the end um, and we're going to go to a summary. Yeah. I really like the way people are using the chat. Let's so see. again, you know, have a quick look in the chat. You can get people's contact details in there. Um, and again, really, this space is, yes, we're doing a, a form of conference, but it's also important for people to connect. You know, this, we want to create spaces like this. And we've got another event coming up um, and we're going to talk about it later on the 21st of January at the when we go into the new year, and it's really important that we use these spaces to connect and share. And as Latvia has said, how we develop, you know, um, a, a resource as equal partners so that we can really um, serve the communities that we live in. Um, so Rudy, over to you, um, and then right. we're gonna go to a summary, I think. Yeah, before we go to summary, just uh, Deverton's, Bishop deverton has got his hand up. And just to say as well, in a sense, following from Latvia's point, uh, maybe one of the things to think about building the capacity for prevention, you know, the case for um, 
collaboration and doing things that are about pre prevention and getting into the community early, as opposed to people trying to find their way, you know, to access the system. <laughs> that, that might be something of interest for 2021. Right, Brilliant. Everton. Uh, thanks. Uh... Thanks, Rudy. My battery's dying, so it'll be quick. Uh, just want to extend thanks, uh, really, to uh, Beresford and the team uh, for putting this on, Dr. Lindsay. But I've got a confession to make. I actually came on here with an ulterior motive, I have to say. Um, as someone who has suffered with mental health uh, in the past, uh, probably still suffering with mental health, <laughs> um, I, I am keen you know, um, the, the church scene is probably one of the most influential organization within our community. And as a church that has actually stepped out to, to address mental health and to, you know, challenge this stigma, you know, I, I mentioned the, the film we made yeah. earlier, um, it's Faith in Mind, if anybody want to watch it. Faith, faith in mind, uh, search it on YouTube, it is there. But uh, what I would really like, what I came on to ask, or one of the things, is could we as a forum get together and look at the uh, rudimental skills uh, or, or tools that is needed and fee I mean, it may well, um, exist and, and, and see if we can put a toolkit together so that every church could actually have this in our library, in our church uh, to share where maybe once a year we would sit our congregation down and say, this film has been put together to educate us, to upskill us, to deal with our own mental health and that of others around us. I just close by saying the way I see mental health, it is a spectrum that all of us find a place on, you know, and using that kind of a theory to debunk the, the stigmas, the fact that we are all on there and finding out where each others are, you know. So um, for me, I would like to see that come out of this, you know, um, not for the church, just churches in the black community, but churches right across, um, the landscape and obviously other organizations too would find that use of useful. So I'm in whenever that is going to take place. All right, that's a challenge for Beresford to coordinate. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Rudy. <laughs> but I, of course, I'd be more than happy to do it. It's, as you said, it's within my skill and within my gift. So I'd be more than happy to do that. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. So, Beresford, I think as we're wrapping up now, just got nine minutes or so, um, we're going to have a summary from Professor Martin Livermore, MBE, Deputy, Le De uh, Deputy Lieutenant. He's also a member of the Association of Jamaica Nationals Management Committee. Thank you, Rudy. Uh, before I sum up, I think it would be absolutely useful if everybody can turn the video on. Keep off mute, but just turn your video on so we can see faces. Let's not let's not hide ourselves. Let's turn our videos on. I don't think we have time for people to get dressed, Martin. You've been hiding yourself. I don't. I don't think they need. I don't think it's right. There's a reason. There is a reason in summarising this, and I go back to the reason we're all jointly pulled ourselves around. Uh, and that's looking at the role of primary care and community services in connecting the dots and providing information. And it's a staggering situation. And I, I was listening to uh, the young people on, the, on this. Um, BAME people, perhaps one in eight, are affected at any one time with poor mental health. One in eight. Now, mental health and mental health problems comes with a numerous and complex 
number of things, but predominantly their likelihoods around addiction, homelessness, abuse, and they frequently occur in families with social deprivation and poor education. Even more starkly is that more men, more young men than women are casualties of mental health and suicide. So the question is how do we join the dots? How do we provide a network of not just well-meaning individuals, but those that have got developed empathy, engaged understanding, the ability to listen, but more importantly, to ask the right questions. Tonight, we've used a platform that back in 2019, many of us would never decide to integrate, uh, to integrate with or even try to understand. That's a platform of digitalization. I.e. the spoken word, the gentle touch, the connected ability to say, I am here just to listen. Nobody ever admits to being, or very few of us admit to having a mental health issue. And very few of us actually even find real solutions. As far as Latvia has mentioned, it's about the democracy of a single voice, a community voice, be able to coordinate, influence, and change policy. But how can you do that if you haven't got a single democratic platform that will recognize all the individuals that were there to support. This evening is about coming together. It's not about our own individual selfishness, it's about recognizing that there is a genuine problem in society whether that is religious, cultural, even gender. Mental health touches and affects a wide swath of our society, far more, uh, far more reaching than we let it and leave it to believe. So to me, this evening is a continuation of the something that took place back in 2019. When the call came out, Young Lives Mattered. It's obviously been further reinforced through the issues of this year with Black Lives Matter. It is about disproportionality, inequality, and poor access to service, communication, networking, and more importantly, being real. The problems that are faced by those who seek to access to service is generally one of us not talking or basically asking, how are you really? So, out of the recommendations from that conference and symposium 12, oh, just over 12 months ago, the big ask was how do you remain connected? Individual organizations, individuals, collectively, how do you actually feed back in to the policymakers? And more importantly, how do you also sit within those channels of policymaking? It isn't about our individual 
organizations and survival. Balance is always going to be out there. But it's also about how do we collectively change our region. The mayor mentioned his mental health project, both within industry and what he's tried to do uh, within the community. But actually, the real people who know the problems are ourselves. So, in conclusion, we need to reach out more. We need to connect the dots. Not just about individual organizations, but also to provide a platform for those who seriously need our help can access our help in a single, unified, and coordinated way. If not, then those young lives, young black lives, will still be just the number. I like to end. Anything we come out with from this, must have impact. It must not just be a call to arms, but a call to action. Something that actually reawakens and touch, especially those groups in the public being, that are not on this line. For every life lost through mental health is an asset lost to society. So, I would conclude by saying signposting is highly important, but collective, collaborative responsibility is just as important. Communities have got a role to play, but they cannot do that in isolation. So thank you very much. And I hand back over to you, Rudy. Thank you for that, um, Martin. Thank you very much. And, uh, great summary of uh, what has been said and what needs to be done, most importantly. I'd now like to ask uh, Mrs. Karen Duke-Thompson from the AGN just to give the vote of thanks and then we'll close. Thank you, Rudy. Good evening, everyone. It is an honor to, be, to propose a vote of thanks to all those who have helped in making this evening event possible. Thank you to Dr. Lindsay for your welcome message and sharing your experience. I would also like, like to thank Mayor Andy Street for endorsing the event. Rudy Page and Beresford Douglas, thank you for facilitating the session. Thank you. We are grateful for our contributors, panelists, who are helping in various ways to support the community. Pause, Bethel Health and Healing Network, Cruise Bereavement Care, Chaplaincy, Spiritual Care, Birmingham Solihull, Solihull mm -hmm. Melton Health Care Trust, Waits, The Listening Hub, Cultural Connection. Thank you for making time to share this evening with us. The services to share with us, the services that are available. Dean, thank you for sharing your experience. Thank you, Professor Livermore, for putting together the summary. Collaboration is really needed. Thanks to this evening's host, the Association of Jamaica Nationals, Birmingham and Solihull Mental Health Foundation Trust, to our supporters, Diamond Travel, the New Testament Church of God, Hansworth, and MCW, a big thank you. Thank you to everyone who joined. The takeaway from this session is, there are services available. Share what you know, what you have heard this evening. It may help someone. Once again, it is, our con it is your coordinated help that has made this evening possible. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, Beresford, do you want to say something about the 21st? You're on mute. Yeah, sure. Uh, and again, I, I want to just take special thanks to say thank you to Caroline as well for putting this together in terms of the links and, and making sure that the presentations and everything 
run smoothly. I think it's really important. So thank you, Caroline. I know you're there hiding away, but thank you. Um, so yes, we want to keep these events um, going regularly. So the next one is on the 21st of January. Um, and we anticipate um, similar partners, if not the same partners, and certainly we're gonna be promoting it much wider to the wider community. And I think if you think this is necessary, which I'm sure the energy that I'm feeling from this group is that it is very necessary. So I want you to share it to your communities and your networks so that when it does come to the 21st, we want you to share that as wide as possible so that we get a, a larger section of our community involved in the discussion and the debate. So 21st of January, um, which is again, a Thursday evening, six to eight, um, it'd be great if you could all make it. Thank you so much. And we will be sharing the link on, on this. So Beresford will circulate the link in the next 24 hours or so. So thank you very much, everybody, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well done, everyone.